Good morning, Phoenix, and welcome to the House of Mystery radio show. This is the place to come for true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. Only on KFNX 1100 Independent Talk Radio. We're here every Saturday morning, 6 to 7 a.m., and I'm your host, Al Warren. Back. Joining us, Steve Hodel. Um, thank you for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Great to be with you. Yeah, it's been something I've been uh, looking forward to for quite a while. It's, uh, I'm, we're, I'm glad that we uh, got you on the show. Uh, uh, let's start out with um, some of the basics. Let's start out, first of all, with um, who you are, kind of, and um, a little bit about your history. Okay, well, let's see. I was born in Los Angeles, and I'm 70, almost 74 in a few more months. <laughs> um, born in L.A., uh, joined the Navy at 17, uh, did four years, got out, and did what a lot of military uh, kids did back then was join LAPD right at 21. And uh, uh, I worked uniform patrol in Los Angeles for, and I joined in 63, so it was kind of right at the height of the Dragnet, and uh, you know, um, there was a lot of real strong promotion for the department back then. Uh, and uh, I was what they used to call the new breed back then. Uh, chief uh, Bill Parker was our chief, probably uh, LA's most famous chief. And uh, uh, I was 21, going on 15, <laughs> looking looking young. And uh, so I was, you know, kind of like. Type casting. I was right out of central casting, I guess. Um, five years in uniform patrol. Then I uh, went to detectives in the uh, Hollywood division. Uh, L.A. has 18 divisions, uh, which you may call precincts. And um, Hollywood uh, uh, was one of those 18. Started working detectives, worked all the tables, robbery, burglary, juvenile, uh, sex crimes, and then eventually uh, graduated to homicide table, uh, where I stayed for the next 18 years. Wow. Um, 24 years on LAPD, 18 in homicide, 300 murder separate murder investigations. Uh, we had a very uh, a, a good team there in Hollywood. We had one of the highest solve rates in in the city. We were running about. 75 to 80 percent solve, which is exceptionally high. Right now, you're seeing averages of about 50 percent, which is kind of sad because that means every other yeah. killer is getting away with it. Well, anyway, what, do you, what do you think that is? Ahead. Like, is, is there like something? What's different about it now? Do you think? Oh, a lot of things. Um, basically, I think a lot of it has to do with morale. Uh, also. Uh, I think that uh, technology has its pluses, but it's also uh, it, de it has its detractions. Uh, one of them might be people skills. I mean, one of the one of the probably the strongest assets in solving crimes is being able to deal with people, to develop informants, to talk with people, to get confessions, and that sort of thing. And I think there's a little bit of uh, loss in that in that direction for a number of reasons. It's not just the individuals. Uh, do cops fault? It's it's uh, some of it has to do with training. Some of it has to do with they're so so dark, damn busy they don't have time to uh, you know much time to put into individual cases. And I mean there's a whole bunch of factors, but yeah, yeah. the numbers speak for themselves. You know it's it's dropped to 50 percent, and it should be. Yeah. Hopefully we can get it back up higher. And uh, and so I put in. Uh, so I was on the department from 1963 to 1986. And I retired um, with 20, almost 24 years on the department and uh, moved north to Bellingham, Washington. I had two young boys, five and seven, and um, my wife, and we, we went north and uh, kind of to get out of the mean streets. It was kind of a, back then in the 80s, it was kind of a mass exodus from L.A. <laughs> for a number of reasons. Crime was up and gang gangs were a real problem. So we... Um, Checked out. I checked out Northern California and Oregon, the Northern California, Oregon, and then finally came to Bellingham, Washington, and it was kind of like the the last stop before Canada. 
and uh, checked out the schools, which were really great, checked out the housing, which was great. And uh, following summer, we moved up to Bellingham, and I was there for 10 years, did, uh, became a, a PI doing criminal defense. I had done 24 years for the prosecution, and, and now I was basically working on criminal cases as a defense investigator. Uh, and uh, that was a good balance for me to kind of see the other side of the coin, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, l learned a lot and uh, became kind of became the only game in town there. In fact, I think I was the, the first private uh, investigator in Billingham that ever got a, got a <laughs> license. Anyway, uh, and uh, my boys went through middle school, high, high school there. And um, then in 19, uh, 1999, I got a phone call from, my, uh, from San Francisco, and it was my father's w wife. And she said, your father's collapsed. The paramedics are here. They've just pronounced him dead. Come down. So I jumped the next plane, flew down to San Francisco, and um, did all the things you have to do to uh, take care of the passing of a father. Right. And um, uh, was there with her for a few days, and that kind of began this this incredible adventure that's still ongoing to this day. Uh, a number of things came into my possession at that time that kind of started the ball rolling work what I call catalysts, and um, if you want, I can kind of list those off. Yeah, sure. Uh, or or would it be maybe better to do some background on my father so your well, listeners can get uh, it? Yeah, cause, well, yeah, we can go into your father, actually, because yeah, I, I was also going to say um, maybe um, because I, I kind of know where we're going with all this, but a lot of the audience mm -hmm. won't. Uh, what was it like? Like, what was your, your home life like? Was it uh, were your pretty happy kid, things were pretty stable. Um, where did you come from? So maybe that's how we can get into your father, kind of talk about your dad that way. Yeah, well, my, my father being, uh, and, and w when you hear his bio, and you know it, but when your listeners hear it, they'll, they'll see why, but he was a very uh, unique individual, and uh, he wasn't your, your typical uh, father in the sense uh he wasn't exactly warm and fuzzy. He was kind of uh, aloof, cool, intellectual, and um, uh, because of his position of power, he was um, he wasn't just a family man. But beside that, uh, I had always been very close to my father. Um, uh, he was um, traveling a lot, and uh, uh, basically. Um, Mom raised us for the most part, and then of course we lived with Dad uh, until I was nine, and then he left the country. And uh, we're I was so I was raised by my mom, who instilled a lot of values in me that you know, love of people, uh, a, a lot of very positive things in me. And um, so you know, I didn't really know my father that well. Uh, he was this kind of man of mystery as I was growing up, um, and I wouldn't get to know him until, actually, as the face would have it, I was stationed in the Philippines, and he was living in Manila. So for two years, I got to visit him on a regular basis. We became quite close. And then um, when he ultimately returned to the United States in 1990 for the last decade of his life, we became very close. And um, there are those that read naysayers that say, oh, this is a daddy dearest. It's not at all. He, uh, I was very close to him. He was, he had 11 children, five different women, and, and uh, I was his favorite, go figure. <laughs> and um, so that last decade of his life, he came up to Bellingham, visited me, he and his wife June, and I went to San Francisco on a regular basis to visit them, and, and it was a, uh, we became quite close, and uh, it was a very warm relationship. Wow! So I have, I you know, I had nothing but respect and admiration, and, and in many respects, it, I was in awe of my father because of all of his amazing gifts, which we'll talk about in a minute. Was he supportive of you being in the LAPD and being your career path? What, did did he like that? Well, he 
was continually encouraging me to, to to leave the department to come over and join him. He uh, after he left the country, he got, became a market researcher and became a very had 18, 18 offices in eighteen countries and uh, kind of became the leading expert, market research expert in Asia. And he w- kept wanting me to come and join him. And uh, by then, I was you know like halfway through the department. I uh, um, you know, I had uh, just 10 years to go, and I thought, yeah, you know. So I went over. I actually took an extended leave and went over and looked at his business and traveled through many of the Asian, uh, the countries, Hong Kong, Japan, Manila, and took a couple of months off and, and seriously considered it. But then in the end, for a number of reasons, which I can talk about later, uh, I decided against it. I, I wanted to, because, number one, I loved what I was doing as a, Big City Homicide Detective. It was a lot of fun. It was interesting, and it was service to people, and a lot of things that uh, his offer, his job offer, didn't didn't give. So right. in the end, I turned it down. Yeah. So so let's talk about uh, um, your father um, and uh, tell us a little bit about him. Give him, give us the bio. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, Dad was born in Los Angeles in 1907, uh, downtown L.A. Fifth and Olive, right where the Biltmore Hotel is, oddly enough. Um, he was an only child. Uh, his his parents were uh, Russian Jews. They had come over at the turn of the century, like 1901, um, from uh, – my grandfather, George Sr., was from Odessa, and uh, my grandmother, uh, Esther, was from Kiev. Um, they fled – Russia. Uh, actually, my grandfather fled Russia, went to Paris, where he met Esther. She was a, a attractive, intelligent woman. In, amazingly, she was a dentist. Can you imagine being a, a woman dentist at the turn of the century? Uh, I know. She, <laughs> I mean, a very unusual. But she was very bright. Uh, they, they married, uh, came over, uh, came out to Los Angeles, and, and Dad was born in '07 only child. Uh, they were living, uh, he had a, a beautiful home built in uh, the South Pasadena area. Uh, and uh, dad was identified early on as a, as a highly gifted intellectually. Um, he was a musical prodigy. He played his own piano concerts at the Shrine Auditorium at the age of nine, um, uh, beating out adults in his abilities. And uh, his music teacher was predicted he had a, a, a you know an amazing career in, in, in as a concert pianist. Uh, he went to junior high school in South Pasadena. Uh, he was intellectually gifted to the point where he scored the highest uh, test scores in California in the public schools. Uh, and became part of a, a pilot program back in the mid 20s. Uh, early 20s uh, by a doctor, Lewis Terman from Stanford, who developed, he actually developed the term IQ. And anyway, he developed uh, these uh, a group of highly gifted children throughout California, and uh, they became known as Terman's termites. And the study was ongoing for 75 years. There's been five books written on these uh, gifted children. And... Uh, uh, they would send in market. Uh, they would send in responses to their life and what was going on every five years. They fill out this survey, so he actually tracked their lives, which was really this amazing study. Anyway, Dad was one of the termites. He uh, graduated. He, he he went to um, his IQ was identified as 186, one point above Einstein, and um, incidentally, that skips a generation. <laughs> But my, my 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 boys are in good shape. <laughs> uh, but he went to he went to uh, Caltech at the age of uh, fifteen, enrolled there, uh, was there a year. Had uh, not only was he intellectually gifted and, and musically gifted, he also was sexually precocious and had an affair with uh, one of the professor's wives at Caltech. She got pregnant. Uh, it busted up her marriage. Uh, she went back east to have the child. And, of course, Dad, after a year at Caltech, was asked to leave. 
he followed her back east and said, you know, I, I want to marry you. I want to be the father. And, and and the woman just kind of laughed at him and said, George, you're a you're a boy yourself. Get out of my life. You've ruined my life. Please leave. <laughs> so he came back um, to Los Angeles. Now he's uh, I think he's like 17 now. Passed himself off as 21. Did some cab driving uh, for Yellow Cab with a fake fake ID and stuff. So he got a job with the uh, as a crime reporter for the LA Record newspaper. Uh, started writing around, this is during Prohibition, and uh, writing around with LAPD vice officers, uh, kicking in doors, and he would go in and take names and write these tabloid articles in the newspaper the next day where the judge was seen with a young blonde, that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, then he graduated and started writing around with LAPD homicide and would go on their call-outs, and the same thing, he'd write these you know, tabloid stories, the bloody ace of spades next to the body, that sort of thing. So he did that, and then he started double dating uh, with uh, a friend of his, an artist uh, uh, by the name of John Houston. Uh, well, many of your listeners probably know John Houston uh, as the famous film director. Well, this is the same individual, but back then, in his teens, he was friends with close friends with Dad, and and the two of them uh, were double dating in Los Angeles. Uh, George was dating a woman by the name of Dorothy, and uh, 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 John was dating a woman by the name of Emily. And after a couple of weeks, they switched, and and John fe uh, and Dorothy fell in love, and they ran off and went back east to New York. They got married as teenagers. And uh, that kind of left George and Emily looking at each other. I, I guess it's you and me, babe. She gets pregnant, and Dad and Dad and she go north. He decides he wants to go to medical school. He goes to Berkeley um, uh, for pre-med, four years. Gets a job with the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper as a uh, as a uh, reporter and a columnist. He has his own column there. He writes. 14 or 16 different uh, extended pieces on San Francisco uh, and goes across the bay to UCSF San Francisco uh, Medical School, um, is there for four years, of course, and uh, becomes a medical doctor in 1936 and graduates. Among his many gifts, he also has this exceptional hot eye hand coordination. So he's a skilled surgeon, and he has a, a couple of uh, affairs with women. Uh, he has a uh, he uh, Emily has a son by the name of Duncan, who's born in 28 to him, and uh, he has an affair with another woman, uh, and a daughter is born to them by the name of Tamar, in 35. He graduates in 36. Needs decides he needs some space, leaves the girls, leaves the children, and takes off become a sole surgeon at a logging camp in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. Um, does that for a, a couple of years and then returns to Los Angeles where he hooks back up with the original Dorothy, who is now after seven years divorced from John Houston. Uh, and they get back together and my older brother Michael is born in 39. I come along, I'm at 41. Younger brother Kelvin is born in 42. Dad has got a job with LA County Health Department. Uh, he quickly rises to the top in a few years and becomes the head of venereal disease control for the entire county of Los Angeles. Um, uh, so he's the go-to guy uh, in all things VD. Buys himself this amazing mansion in Hollywood, Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. built. Uh, it's a kind of a Mayan temple. It's a, it's a famous historic house in, in Hollywood called the Soden House. Uh, he moves the, it, we, uh, we all move in in 45, and we're there for five years until 1950. Um, everything's going along swimmingly, and uh, uh, in 1949, there's a knock on the door, and it's LAPD, and they say, Dr. Hodel, and he says, yes. And he says, say you're under arrest for incest. Um, 
big scandal headlines headed of LA County Health arrested for child molestation. Well, it turns out that you recall I mentioned Tamar, who was born in 35. Well, she's now 14, living with us for the summer at, in, in Hollywood in the mansion. And uh, she runs away, picked up by the police, and, and for, you know, they said, why'd you run away? And she discloses that her, uh, her father had sex with her and, and, and others had sex with her. And so she's detained, placed in uh, protective custody. And at a trial, it's, charges are filed against my father. There's a trial. He hires uh, Jerry Geisler. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, but Geisler was a kind of a Johnny Cochran of his day. Okay. He was a he was a you know the top criminal defense attorney in the nation. He handled all the stars, mostly sex crimes. Three week trial. Dad. Uh, anyway, the jury comes back in about 45 minutes and kind of an OJ decision verdict and says not guilty. Dad flees the country. Uh, well, he leaves the country, and um, he uh, uh, creates a new life, and he goes to Hawaii, which is a territory, becomes a psychiatrist, uh, then uh, meets and marries a, a Filipino woman, they go to Manila, and he spends the next 40 years living, home-based in Manila, but traveling throughout the uh, uh, Asia and Europe, and uh, has four more children. Uh, with her, divorces her after about five years, has a number of affairs, and ultimately in 1990 he returns back to San Francisco, gets himself a penthouse suite downtown San Francisco on the 39th floor, and that's when I hooked back up with him in 1990, and we spent the next decade. Um, and then he dies in, in 99 at the age of 91 with 11 children. and. It's amazing uh, having lived this amazing life. Right. So, so when that happened back back in 1949 with the 14 year old, like your half sister, how did that affect the family at the time? How did how did everybody like this? Must have been a big shock for everybody, like in the family, like yourself. Um, what, well, I never knew actually. What what happened was it was kept kept from us, the boys. We were placed in a military school, and. Uh, I wouldn't learn about it until about, um, oh, I think it was about three or four years, you know, when I was maybe 13 or 14 is the first time I dis discovered what actually happened. And, uh, um, but um, basically, Jerry Geisler, this attorney, you know, uh, painted Tamar, the 14-year-old, as a pathological liar, and he said she's making this stuff up, it's all a fantasy, yada, 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 and uh, the jury... Uh, believed it, we would find out later that apparently there were payoffs to the DA's office and, uh, and a number of things that some of the reports would later reveal. But at the time, it, it uh, you know, basically uh, uh, he was able, Dad, and d Dad maintained that too, that she was lying and, and had created the whole thing. Um, but uh, as, as we get into a little bit later, we'll, we'll, we can see what happened on that, but basically at, at that time, it was just, uh, you know, he, he was found not guilty and he left the country, is all we knew back then. Right. And we really didn't know any of the details. Mom didn't really go into anything until we were older, until, and I wouldn't find out really more about it until I was a, an adult, Yeah. mostly uh, the details. And, and I always believed, of course, a lot of the family members didn't believe Tamar. Uh, later on, and I always believed her because, well, number one, I knew, you know, Dad had, you know, sex was one of his, you know, problems. I mean, he was, he was a, a sexual man, and, and uh, but, but um, so I never had any problems with it, and I actually was able to see some of the reports uh, once I became a LAPD. I was, I actually looked up some of the actual reports from the trial and. You know, it was a strong case. Mm. Amazingly, they had three adults present during the sex acts. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, two of them testified initially at the preliminary hearing, and then they refused to testify at the trial. Uh, were, were, were obviously, were threatened, and they just both refused to say anything. Uh, and um, so, you know, he was able to, the attorney was able to present it as a, you know, 
just a pathological liar, lying daughter was fantasizing. Right. Wow. That's too bad. I, I would think that that would have been, uh, it would have been kind of uh, a little bit hard even uh, with the neighbors in the community. I mean, he was in a good part of town and he was a well-known doctor, so. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, and a lot of the neighbors, you know, I mean, uh, one of the uh, things that came, did came out later was that uh, a lot of the neighbors apparently knew a lot more than than, they, than was indicated and, and would come forward kind of as witnesses. We, we actually had people living at the house at the time. Uh, he was actually renting out a number of the rooms at this uh, Mayan temple uh, to, to various actresses and, and artists and stuff. And they would become important witnesses later on, both to the, the fact that he, he did do the, you know, he was guilty of the uh, incest with his 14-year-old daughter and to uh, other things, hmm. other crimes. Yeah. The subject, Black Dahlia, the guest, Steve Hodell, will be back right after these words. Now that brings us to you um, on your uh, research and writing your books, like uh, when you started. Uh, what, what, first of all, the Black Dahlia. Um, what brought you to writing about Black Dahlia? Was it your father or was it something else? Yeah. Well, uh, of course, I had heard, the only thing I knew about the Black Dahlia back, uh, back then was that it was a famous unsolved murder case from the 40s. Uh, when I went through the police academy, they had photographs shown uh, of the crime itself because it was such a, a, a famous, infamous, I guess, uh, crime, L.A. crime. And, uh, but I didn't even know the, the victim's name, Elizabeth Short. All I knew it was a famous cold case from the 40s. And I, as a young homicide detective, was interested in the 60s and the, you know, the present, not the past. Yeah. So I really knew nothing about it, and, and, and it came to me. So I'm, long after I retired, I was, what, 14 years into retirement, uh, and uh, my father's death, I flew down. And I'm sitting there with uh, uh, June, his, his widow, <laughs> and... Um, she brings out a small book, a photo book album, and that's only like three by five inches. And she says, I think your father would want you to have this. It belonged to him. And I open it up, and I'm going through, and there are photographs. And there are photographs of us boys. There are photographs of my mother. A uh, number of photographs by a, a photographer by the name of Man Ray. I don't, are you familiar with who he was? He was a famous surrealist photographer and very close friend of my father's and uh, became quite famous, uh, lived in Paris most of his life. And uh, his, his, his stuff sang in the Getty and, and uh, selling for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So he mm -hmm. became quite fa famous in his, uh, late, in his later years. Uh, back then he was kind of just starting out and, and lived in Hollywood for 10 years and was very close to my father. He was our family photographer. Anyway, there were photographs. Uh, of, of family members, uh, my grandparents, and then I opened up and I came to a photograph of a nude woman reclining with her eyes closed. And I turned to June and I said, June, who is this? She says, uh, I don't know, somebody your father knew from a long time ago. Well, it, it, it looked like, and to this day I don't quite know why Black Dowdy came to my mind, but it did. And I think it was probably, they did it in 1975, they had a television movie called Who is the Black Dahlia? And uh, Lucy Arnaz played the Dahlia. And uh, the photograph looked exactly like that. So that might have been my source on that. But for whatever, and it just comes to, you know, kind of floats in and floats out Black Dahlia. But I didn't think much of it. And then a couple of days later, I'm on the telephone to Tamar, my half-sister, uh, George being both our, the father to both of us. Yeah. She's in Hawaii. She's in Hawaii, and she was the victim of the incest. And uh, we're talking about the great man's passing and uh, what a remarkable life he led and stuff. And out of the blue, she says, "Well, you know, Steve, he was uh, he was suspected of being the Black Dahlia." And I said, "What? What are you talking about, Samar?" I said, "What? Well, we had only had maybe 15 minutes of conversation in 50 years." 
<laughs> so, so you know, she after the after she was sexualized and and uh, the trial and all of that, she kind of spun out of control and got into drug, sex, rock and roll, San Francisco, uh, kind of the original Mother Earth hippie, yeah, uh, and all of that. So, so we had very little contact. She would occasionally call me when she. You know, maybe she was arrested for possession of marijuana. She needed some bail or something. But other than that, I just had no contact with her. So we're talking, and she, and she says this, and I said, "Where is this coming from, Tamar?" She says, "Well, that's what the police told me when I when I was, you know, in detention. They taking me to and from court on the incest trial. They said that we think that uh, your father, telling her, we think your father was uh, the Black Dahlia suspect, and they have a lot of reasons for it." So I'm thinking, no, there's no way. I said, you know, I, for whatever reason, as I had mentioned, I was uh, probably knew my thought. I knew my father better than anyone. I was really close just to him and had more contact with him than any of his other children. And uh, I was aware of his, you know, sexual obsession and some of his other eccentricities. But, but killer, no way. You know, he he couldn't have done that. And, and so. Um, so that was the second kind of blinking red light was what Tamar said. So I start looking into the case and I find out her name's Elizabeth Short and I start getting the details and the like I'm divorced at that time and my girlfriend's in LA and I'm having her send me up all of the newspaper clippings and articles from the five different newspapers in LA on the original case. And uh, there's a massive amount of material. So she's sending me up, and, and one of the articles she sends me is, I look at the front page of the newspaper, and it's, well, what happened was the killer, and we probably need to get into a little description of what happened on the Dahlia, but after the killing, the killer started sending in um, uh, written messages taunting the police, catch me if you can, I'm going to Mexico, I'll give myself up for $20,000, all sorts of kind of disguised writing, cut and paste notes like ransom notes, that sort of thing. Hmm. And one of these uh, says, it said, turning myself in on January 29th, had my fun at the police, and he finds it Black Dahlia Avenger. And this, of all of them, this is the only one that's undisguised, uh, handwriting. And I look at it, <laughs> this is my father's handwriting. And I, you know, I mean, you know, you know, you know your parents' handwriting. Your listeners know their parents' handwriting, and I know my father's. And I said, wait a minute, this can't be. There's got to be some other explanation here. And I said, maybe is he pretending to be? What's going on here? Yeah. And I do more research, uh, heard research, and I discover that the killer was a was a surgeon, that the body was expertly uh, bisected at the waist in a special procedure that was taught in medical schools in the 30s called a hemicorpectomy. It wasn't, this wasn't a butcher or, a, you know, uh, this was a skilled surgeon and the and LAPD uh, believed that a doctor had done it. So that was another blinking red light. And I thought, oh, yes. So there's no way, well, I'll, I'll be able to show that he had nothing to do with this. So at that point I realized I need to relocate back to L.A., and, you know, I can't do an absentee investigation on this. So I relocated back to L.A. in 2000 or 2001, and I would start my investigation. I would do interviews. I would do contacts with all sorts of uh, individuals. Ultimately, I, uh, without, we, we just don't have time to go through all the details, but basically I was able to develop uh, a strong case. I went in secret to the district attorney's office presented it uh, with the photo exhibits, and I had handwriting analysis um, done by a handwriting expert and uh, confirmed that the handwriting was, in fact, George Hodel's, independent of my own identification. Um, and, you know, basically what I was doing was, you know, I was, I, I, it was a two-pronged investigation into the mysterious life of my father uh, that I knew little about and also into the, his potential uh, connection to the, the, the murder itself. As I proceeded, I discovered that uh, LAPD believed that the, the, there were a number of murders from, 19, from the beginning of the 1940s to 1950 
about nine or ten uh, with the L.A. lone uh, woman murders, and, and they were LAPD believed that many of them were connected to each other. Uh, at least four or five they listed. Well, by the time I was through, I felt nine or ten were connected. Um, so I present this in secret to the, my findings to the uh, DA. He reviews it for a couple of months, comes back and says, you know, based on your investigation, he says, I would file two counts of murder against your father were he still alive. I would file the Black Dahlia Elizabeth Short murder, and I would file a second murder, which was known as the lipstick murder, where the killer actually wrote a, a, a lipstick uh, message uh, a, uh, on the body itself, on the new body, posed it in a vacant lot just like he had the Dahlia. Hmm. He says the others are interesting, he says, but not quite enough for a filing. He says, but, but based on your investigation, I would file, and I believe I could easily win it in a, in a jury, with a jury. So with that, uh, I decided, okay, I'll, I'll go public, and I'll, I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll write this up and, and, and reveal it to the public. I had attempted to meet with LAPD for the six months prior to sit down and lay it all out to them, and they kept putting me off and putting the DA and I off together and saying, you know, we don't have time for this. So ultimately, we ran out of time. The book came out, and and it was a you know very controversial. A, a lot of you know press on it. You know, Dateline did a 48 hours. Uh, Dateline did a piece on it, 48 hours in a piece, and, and a num there've been about six or eight different hour shows on my investigation. And uh, so that was in '03 when the book, came, the first version came out. Well, that what happened then was it blasted open. Uh, the secret DA files, uh, and what what happened was uh, Steve Lopez of the LA Times. Uh, I had given him a kind of a heads up on this and saying, you know, this is, this will be coming out, and uh, because he was a watchdog kind of guy, and I thought he would be a good guy to go to. So he goes to the DA and says, hey, there's this hotel. He says his father is a black guy killer. He had, you know, all of this stuff. And the DA says, well, I'm not spending a, a, a dime of uh, county money on this. But he says, there is a box in the vault on the dally if you want to take a look at that. <laughs> he says, and Lopez says, I'd love to. So he gives him this box, which he's which the DA has never looked at. And Lopez carries it upstairs, sits in the room, opens up the box, takes out a file, and out falls a photograph of Dr. George. Hill Hodel. Now, this file has been locked away for 55 years. Nobody's seen it since 1950. And uh, uh, he says, whoa, so he was a suspect. And he goes through and he just, what does he discover? He discovers that uh, not only was he a suspect, he was the prime suspect. And that uh, L.A. And, and the D.A.'s investigators back in 1950, three years after the murder, uh, went out to the, uh, picked George Hodel up, took him into the Hall of Justice for questioning. And while he was there, they broke into the, this Mayan temple we were still living in, in Hollywood, and bugged it. They basically put hard microphones in the walls, and uh, in the living room and in the bedroom, and uh, ran hard wires, connected them to the Pacific telephone lines, ran that to Hollywood Police Station two miles away set up a recorder and listen 24-7 for the next 42 days. Tape recorded all the conversations. This isn't a phone bug, this is actual hard live conversations. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, they got a lot of damning statements and admissions and confessions from Dad. Uh, basically, uh, uh, we don't have to go through all of them, but basically, they also suspected him two, a year and a half before that murder of, of overdosing his secretary, a woman by the name of Ruth Spalding. Hmm. And he was investigated. He was investigated on that as a probable murder investigation. It was listed ultimately as a suicide. They couldn't prove that he did the forced overdose on her. Of pills, they were having an affair, and apparently she was going to reveal some information she had learned about George. Now this is prior to the Dahlia murder, so it was either one of the other murders, earlier murders, or uh, the fact that he was performing abortions, which came out 
in the tape, tape record, secret tape recordings, or or who knows? It could have been one of anything. Anyway, she was uh, she overdosed and he supposedly took her into the hospital. She was comatose. She died 20 minutes later. So um, basically, <coughs> uh, there were a lot of admissions he made. Uh, one of them was um, that were tape recorded. He said, "Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia." They can't prove it now. My secretary's dead, which referred to Ruth Spalding, who probably could have identified him as, as knowing and been acquainted with Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia. Uh, the police reports verify that he did know Elizabeth Short, that they were having an affair or at least were acquainted uh, prior to her death. And, and uh, there's a whole massive amount of he. He talks about performing abortions. He talks about... Uh, uh, the, the actual killing of Ruth Spalding talk, describes taking her to the hospital. He describes putting a pillar over her head. Um, uh, and he says, I think the police may have found out about it. Um, I think they figured it out. And he goes on and on with all, all sorts of incriminating statements. So he's about to be arrested by LAPD and the DA's investigators in 1950 uh, in uh, March and suddenly he takes off, he's probably warned by one of his insiders, takes off and leaves the country, splits, and um, literally leaving LA, uh, the DA's investigators with their microphones up the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so so they, they pull out, and um, anyway, all very damning because, you know, Steve O'Dell could talk for 20 hours about all of the evidence and connections, but it's still Steve O'Dell saying it. So, but here you have independent confirmation by uh, official police reports that he was the prime suspect and he confessed to it. So, and they had the, these were actually transcripts they had uh, of the uh, tape recordings. So that obviously, you know, and that, that came out in a later updated chapter in my book, and I built on that. And um, then new new, new uh, witnesses came forward that uh, indicated. Uh, they knew all along that he, he was the killer, and, and just at this point, we're way beyond any reasonable doubt in regards to um, him being the the Black Dahlia killer, and and the other probably the other eight or nine murders. So, so what you've got is a serial killer in yeah. Los Angeles operating for ten years. So they didn't. Um, the police at the time did not associate a serial killer. I guess that wasn't really kind of a known thing back then, but they never really put it to being one person? No, they did. But but you're right. The, the term serial killer hadn't been invented yet. But <laughs> what they what called him, what back then they called it called him a chain killer. <laughs> there you go. And uh, that was the 40s term for it, chain killer. <laughs> and no, they had actually, that's, the, there's a number of myths in the, in the Black Dahlia investigation. Uh, one of my problems in moving forward was I had to I had to separate the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. I, you know, the, there's so much myth stacked upon myth on, on, on her and on the victim that I had to, you know, separate it and, and figure out what was true and what was not before moving forward. In other murder cases, you just start with a clean tablet and move forward. In this one, I had to take all the garbage off, off it, so that really compounded the problem. And there was but a that lot. Said, yeah. th th there was a lot, and... But that said, um, th they knew they, th that's another that, that's one of the myths that that was a standoff. So I, I say there are three myths. One is Elizabeth Short's missing week. She supposedly had a missing week from the time she was dropped off at the uh, Biltmore to a week later when the body was found. That's totally false. There was no missing week. I was able to establish 14 witnesses uh, who who accounted for each day of her time during that week. Seven of those witnesses knew her personally, so these couldn't be mistaken. So that was the first myth. The second myth was that it was a standalone murder, none before, none after. Totally false. LAPD strongly suspected, and it's all in their reports, that at least four or five of those murders were committed by the same suspect. Uh, they even came out and printed 11 points of similarity on four of the murders in the newspaper back then. So that there's no question that they felt a lot of them were connected. Um, and um, basically, uh, so that, that's why I say, you know, people that have written, these hack writers that have written 
books and theories and magazine articles and you know I have a whole chapter in the book where I re try to rehabilitate her her character. They, they paint her as a prostitute and a you know a druggie and and all of this stuff. None of that was true. She was basically a a naive, innocent uh, 22 year old from Medford, Massachusetts, who came out to Hollywood not to become famous in pictures, but rather to you know, this was during the wartime when she first came out to fall in love, meet Lieutenant Wright, and live happily ever after. I mean, that was the real story. And and she got involved in shark infested waters and 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 started you know uh, eventually started running for her life uh, and, and was caught and killed. Did, no, so, so the, I was going to say, did go her, her murder and the other ones that you sort of associate it with it was there was there a common bond as in like uh, so if George Odell did it like you know a lot of serial killers or chain killers <laughs> had um, the same certain like they wanted a certain type of girl or certain look certain hair certain right. size yeah. was there any of that with these or, or was it just random well that's a good question but you know it's what I call the, the CSI effect um, uh, a lot of people say well but, but but one was blonde and one was brunette, so it couldn't be the same suspect. Or they say one was young and one was old, or or he never, you know, uh, it's ridiculous. You know, especially in jo George Odell's case, he, he was all over uh, the radar screen in regards to his M.O. and his signatures. But there were some common uh, link links, and, and probably one of the strongest was that of the nine murders I talk about, six of them, uh, the killer wrote uh, a taunting message either on the victim's property or mailed it to the police, uh, leaving messages when he wrote on a body. And all, you know, this unique handwriting, hand printing, uh, many of the victims, many of these messages were uh, identified as being written by George Odell by my handwriting expert. Um, so that's very unusual. I mean, I have never had in the 300 cases. I investigated. I never had one where they actually wrote a message or a note. So that's a very unique MO or signature. You've got it on six of them. Uh, the thing to understand about, and this carries through to the later crimes uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area and other other locales, he was an urban terrorist. So his his MO, his 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 real motive for uh, the crimes. Uh, was uh, basically to hold a city hostage, he, you know, and, and scare a city. He was a dad. Was ultimately, I would discover, a, not only was he a misogynist who hated women, but he was a misanthrope. He hated humanity, and his way of of it was to get page, you know, what he demanded to be above the fold on page one in the newspapers, and he did it in Los Angeles, and and managed to stay above uh, the fold for many of his crimes. He did it in the San Francisco Bay Area as Zodiac, and um, he did it in Chicago, uh, Three Crimes in Chicago, which I also go into in, in the sequel. So basically, you know, you can't, you can't use a textbook on George O'Dell. He was, you know, even though there, there's a massive amount, I, when I get into the Zodiac crimes, they actually list 31 major MO signatures that are identical between uh, the uh, Black Dahlia Avenger, George Odell, and Zodiac. Uh, very, very unique, very distinct. If you get two or three of these, uh, you begin to look at it as possibly connected, but 31 is just, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. Right. Anyway, so that, to answer your question, um, he, he, the, it's not the victim type it's common. It's the it's the it's other actions he did, and and there's a whole theme that we probably don't have time to get into, which is uh, his whole theme and uh, on all of this was, and I go into it in detail. Is murder what I call murder is a fine art. Um, he's he's taking uh, items from literature. He's taking music in his crimes. He's using uh, art, uh, literature, film. And he's tying them all into his killings, 
incorporating them, and it's just it's it's mind-boggling. Uh, I'll give you one example in, uh, to start with. In, in Los Angeles, one of the earlier pre-Dahlia murders, uh, there's a radio show, uh, and it's in July of 1943, and it's called the White Rose Murder, and it's they had suspense theater. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh with yeah, that. yeah. The old time radio. Oh show. yeah, yeah. That's um. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it, Maureen O'Hara was a was a young just starting out as a young star, and she uh, played the lead in this. Uh, uh, there was a there was a story by the by a uh, guy named Woolrich, uh, Cornell Woolrich. It's called the White Rose Murders, and they did this radio play. Uh, on air, I think it was a 30 minute. And the story was about a, uh, a killer, a serial killer who killed four or five times. He goes to a dance hall, he picks up a, a woman, takes her out, kills her, leaves a white rose by the body. And he does this uh, to four or five different victims. Well, two weeks after that aired, uh, George Hodel goes to a ballroom a block from his office, medical office downtown LA and um, meets a woman, invites her to he dances with her, charms her. Now, this is a very debonair, young, you know, handsome man, and young doctor, and uh, invites her to Hollywood to show her the scenes, takes her to a isolated golf course, beats, strangles and beats her to death, leaves a white uh, uh, gardenia by the body. And this is two weeks after the airing of the show, and he's following the script almost line by line. And um, that, so that's, you know, that he's, that's kind of gives you one idea. And he goes, he doesn't do this just in, in, in uh, radio, but he does it in all the arts. And there's probably a dozen or 15 different ones that he's taken. He's taken from four or five different films. It's just remarkable. There, there's never, ever been quite an MO quite like it. So, and, uh, so he was pretty serious. He did his job well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, so what what was it about Black Dahlia that sticks out? Like what, like before all of this and your father, why were they still showing pictures like when you were in the police academy, and why was it still something that held the attention of not only the public but the police and other people? Um, years after, like, is there something that you've figured out? To like, what, I guess it's that same old question of why do certain crimes stay with? Well, you know, there yeah. there are a couple of reasons that I I come up with on that. Um, first of all, uh, it's the uh, it got a massive amount back in 1947. Uh, it got a massive amount of publicity. Uh, it was literally headlines for 40 days, and um, uh, it, it went nationwide, but of course heavily covered here in Los Angeles by the five or six newspapers of the day. They were vying to outscoop each other on the story, and uh, you've got a beautiful young woman. Uh, you've got the name uh, Black Dahlia. Now, now that that. The source of that was actually there was a movie called The Blue Dahlia that came out uh, that summer, and uh, it was with Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. And it was a noir film that came out. Yeah. So the uh, soldiers, uh, she, she used to hang out at a soda fountain down in Long Beach, Elizabeth, while she was out here. And uh, she would go in there, and the guys in there would actually call her The Black Dahlia, uh, kind of a spin off of this movie from Blue Dahlia, even though. The the blue guy was actually a bar, not a person. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> they gave her this name, and one of the news guys called the pharmacy and, and got this information, and came. And so you've got this mysterious black guy, you've got a young, beautiful woman, and then you've got this absolute horror of being. I mean, um, one of the things that made the crime so distinct was the absolute horror uh, inflicted on her. It was a torture, murder. Uh, experts estimate it probably took from four to five hours to complete. Um, cert I won't go into all the details because it's just too gruesome, but basically uh, cuttings around the body, the breast was, one of the breasts was removed. Um, uh, 
pieces of flesh were cut and inserted in her privates. Uh, she was bound and tied. There were ligature marks on her feet and her hands and her neck. Uh, uh, she was uh, sexually molested. Um, slow torture, there were cuttings uh, for, over the body. The mouth was slashed. Actually, it wasn't slashed. That's kind of a, a misrepresentation. It was cut from almost ear to ear with a, with a scalpel. Um, and then it was and then it was washed clean, surgically bisected. Uh, the procedure is called a hemicorpectomy, and you you have to go between the second and third lumbar vertebrae. It's the only way you can divide a body without um, sawing through bone. So th they knew it was a skilled surgeon that did it and that was aware of this. The body was washed clean. It was carefully posed at the at a, in a vacant lot five miles south of Hollywood. Um, so all of these things came together. Of course, the veteran homicide detectives had never seen anything quite like it, and they were shocked and, and stunned. And um, uh, the newspaper coverage, the the name, uh, and it's just kind of all everything there to to make a legend, you know. Yeah. And it was all of this mystery and stuff. In fact, a lot of my opposition, uh, they they don't want it solved. In other words, they believe that the the mystery is, is what it's all about, and if you solve it, it's no longer it doesn't have the same allure, I guess you could say. So, a, a lot of my opposition says, you know, we don't want this solved. Don't mess with our myth, you know. Yeah. And so I think it was basically, and it was also the other factor is that it was the last pr big print story before television. In other words, uh, television was just coming in, and uh, this was kind of like the last really big story uh, to come out just before that. So all of these factors came together, I think, to, to make it what it was. And then, of course, hack writers jumped on that and have been promoting it. Some of the horrific photographs are put in books and um, for everybody to see just how much horror, you know, uh, so they, they sensationalized it. Uh, are there any others out there? Like, have you... Have you read or um, saw any movies or documentaries or anything out there that you sort of um, think think are good work or good good representation of of, of Dahlia and sort of the situation? Uh, I guess the short answer is no. No. Um, the problem is they. The problem is, I mean, ironically, you know, the real story, the real truth of this case, is much more, in a way, sensational, much more bizarre than any story you could, you know, than any of these other stories that have been put out there. You couldn't, you couldn't think this story up. You know, the son of the killer grows up to become a homicide detective and solves the case. I mean, the mind wouldn't even go there if you walked into a, a studio with this as a script. Um, they'd say, get the hell out of here. You know, it's too, too bizarre. Uh, but but there it is, and, and uh, there's really no longer. I'm running about 90, 90 to 95 percent, you know, uh, for conviction. I mean, I, I've proved it beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, you know, it kept building on itself, and now with the second volume coming out, and uh, we, you know, all of the evidence that the new evidence that we've turned up, I was, I've actually been able to establish um, items from the from the hotel residence found at the crime scene. I mean, it was actually, I don't know if you're aware of the cement sacks, but I was actually able to link some 50 pound cement sacks that were established at being at the Franklin House uh, the week, so-called missing week in, in January of 47, that were used to transport the body to the crime scene and were left next to the body and LAPD confirms that these were used to transport from an unknown residence, I've actually been able to connect those through original receipts to the to the house. So that's physical, hard physical evidence. We've a cadaver dog has come back positive on uh, human remains, the, the detective's human remains at the from soil samples at the Franklin house, and uh, these have been analyzed uh, and confirmed that they're specific for human remains as opposed to anything else. So it just goes on and on. We just don't have time to, yeah. to document all, all of the new evidence, too. So, 
so I guess one of the, the points I'm trying to make is that going into the, you know, and, I, and from the conclusion of that investigation on the Dahlia and the other L.A. lone woman murders, I was pulled in from the police reports, actually pulled me into the possibility that George O'Dell could have reinvented himself as, as Zodiac in the 60s. And, and started up the same the same MO and the same signatures and stuff. And I wouldn't have even gone there except that the DA, the police reports actually have Elizabeth Short investigating Dad in Chicago for some crimes. Uh, and that started me off on that and took me into another huge rabbit hole, which ultimately became Most Evil and now the second book, Most Evil 2, which, you know, basically connect him in fact, as in Most Evil 1, the first book I came out with, Dutton, in, in 2009, uh, I looked at, I made a compelling case that George O'Dell was Zodiac, but I, I didn't say case solved. I said, let's do some DNA. Let's take a look at this and see, you know, let, let's get a ruling in or ruling out on DNA. Well, they still haven't developed DNA, but uh, confirmed DNA. But anyway, I kept moving, and I said, you know, Right now, I'm saying, you know, uh, it's a possibility. It's a strong possibility, but I'm not saying the case is solved. Right. So in the last, but the last five years, I've continued working on it, and now I am, with a book that came out last week, Most Evil 2, I am saying yes, and we have, and I'm, I'm offering the reasons and the, and the proofs. And believe me, my reputation is on the line. I would not come out and say that, uh, he is Zodiac unless I felt I had absolutely made the case, and, and that's what I've done in the, in the new book. Well, Zodiac's a pretty hot subject. I know just um, with some of the other books out, and, and I did a, quite a few interviews in one month, a huge response to it, and uh, there's, there's still quite a bit of um, talk about this. So how has that community reacted to you or your book? Do you think that they're sort of not... Well, well, they haven't, first of all, they're not aware of the new, it's just out. So the book, my new book was embargoed. So it just came out last week. So I don't think any, hardly anybody has, has even read it yet. So they, they don't know what is coming. But basically I'm offering a signed uh, confession by Zodiac in one of the original things. I've, de I've decrypted, actually, uh, I didn't do it, a French a Frenchman did it and uh, contacted me, and, and we worked together on it. But basically, have decrypted one of the original Zodiac ciphers, and it's a signed confession by George O'Dell actually admitting to the crime, signing his own name. I mean, this is like, yeah, I can't believe that he would actually do this. You know, I mean, how stupid. But he was. He felt he was. It was one of his weaknesses. You know, I mean, his his. Uh, hubris was his, is his ultimate undoing. You know, he was a megalomaniac, and he concealed this in a cryptic uh, language that he thought nobody would ever break the code. Right. And this French and this Frenchman has done it, and it leaves no doubt. I mean, you know, uh, he signed his name, and and for all to see, and the and the document is genuine. So, you know. They're gonna. My mate, my critics are gonna have a tough time with this one because, you know, there are five letters, and those letters are H O D E L, and, and I don't know what they're gonna be able to do with that. But, but, yeah. but the point is that there's that's only part of it. I mean, that's the what I call the Rosetta Stone. You know, that's the kind of the in a way you could say as an investigator, it's the icing on the cake. But there's a whole lot more to the connection of George Hodel to Zodiac than meets the eye. And again, a lot of it has to do with deconstructing myths, one of them being the, the biggest hurdle I had was for myself to start out was there's no way, I started out by saying there's no way that George Abdel could be Zodiac because he was a much younger man. Well, guess what? Once I got into the weeds of it, I discovered and got the original police reports and stuff and suddenly that age discrepancy disappeared. Uh, originally, uh, well, even in the original bullet, they have him 35 to 45. And uh, the most reliable, the best witness of all of them, um, actually uh, was the police officer, um, uh, the, uh, Donald Fook, uh, who, 
who actually uh, saw him leaving the scene of uh, the San Francisco cabbie murder, Paul Stein. And uh, he, uh, he's the one that said, and he comes out and says, well, actually, it was at the high end of that. I mean, he was more like 45. Yeah. Well, if you talk to a witness and, and he's giving you a stand like that as an investigator, I would say, well, could he have been 47, 48, 49? He's going to say, yeah, he could have been. You know. So you've got that. And then you've got George O'Dell, who was actually 60, but he looked, you know, he could easily pass for mid 40s, mid to late 40s. So suddenly, that, you know, that makes that possible as far as the physical and everything else fits. The shoe size is the same shoe size, on and on. And suddenly, uh, your description, you know, most people just dismissed it saying he was too old. But in fact, he, he wasn't too old at all. He, he looked young, much younger than he was, and, and the suspect was, in fact, in his late 40s. Uh, a couple more composites came out of Zodiac by a couple of artists who make him actually look in his early 50s. And they're, I don't know if you've seen it, but they're almost picture perfect to George O'Dell, including the glasses. Anyway, so you've got the physical, but that's, again, you know, just uh, that puts it in the ballpark. So, yeah. And, and um, ultimately, uh, in my first book, Most Evil, I present probably the most compelling evidence is, again, this game playing where Zodiacs sends in maps uh, to the police and the press and says, you know, it has to do with radians and inches along the, uh, on the map and stuff. And he's, he's basically tells and instructs them. He says, align, align the uh, position, the compass to uh, true north. And so he's instructing them. Well, I, I follow his instructions and basically we come up with uh, the circle, uh, the one line going through his killings in, in the Napa area uh, in Vallejo, and the other uh, line of this 60 degree radian, 58 degree radian, goes directly through the killings in the Presidio, the Paul Stein Cabby, and also directly over the grave of guess who? <laughs> Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, who's buried in Oakland, California. At, uh, Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland goes the line goes directly over her grave, and uh, so there's you know there's a whole bunch of uh, and, and then he connects the zodiac is connecting is to the Mikado. The dad was an expert in the Mikado. He was a radio announcer on on classical music and Gilbert and Sullivan and and it just goes on and on. Too many points. Yeah. And, and, and you know, but but but. Uh, you know, so I'm so going. I guess here's the here's the bottom line in regards to Zodiac. Going into my investigation, we've got uh, we've got the Black Dahlia Avenger, who's a serial killer in Los Angeles, who's sending in notes, taunting the police, handwriting, uh, and all of this. Uh, I, you know, we're starting out with a known. We're starting out with a serial killer that's doing all of the same things that Zodiac is doing 20 years later. And it's, you know, handwriting, I, I include a whole chapter of all, all the samples of my father's handwriting, and I've been, many of the notes of, Zodiac notes have been confirmed by my expert. I don't, I'm not personally really big on handwriting. Uh, I, I have a problem with it. Uh, I think it's too subjective. Right. Uh, you, you get experts to say, yes, this is definitely him, and this other experts say, no, it's definitely not him. Well, that's not science to me. Yeah, science is you know you yeah. don't get both both answers in science. So I, I I have a real problem with it. It's okay to use it as long as you know you have all of your other evidence to go with it. But but to use just handwriting for guilt or innocence, no way. You just can't do that. What do you and think? You then I, I was just going to say, but so if you think he did, um, you know, like the Dahlia and the chain murders, and then he's up to doing Zodiac. What happened in the in-between times? Because it's not typical for someone that um, has an affinity to murder like this to just stop. It certainly isn't. So You're absolutely right, and he didn't. And one of the crimes that I, I document in uh, Most Evil 1, the first book, uh, is a crime that uh, uh, another part of my father's unusual M.O. and this, again, this murder is a fine art and playing games, 
Uh, I start off my first, my earlier book, uh, Most Evil, with three crimes that uh, I believe he committed in Chicago in the 40s in, and before the, before the Dahlia murder. Uh, they were known as the Lipstick Murders, very famous. And there, were, there was a young six-year-old girl by the name of Suzanne and, and uh, two adult women and they were, who were bathtub murders. And these three crimes uh, were supposedly solved by a, a young teenager who supposedly confessed to him and was sent speedily to prison, a guy named Bill Hirons, a very famous case. So I didn't really look at these because I figured, well, the case is solved, no need to. But then I discover in the police reports that Elizabeth Short goes back to Chicago, begins investigating these three lipstick murders on her own, this is all documented in the police reports. This isn't something I'm making up. And uh, actually sleeps with a number of the newsmen uh, to get information on the killings. And, and, and uh, they admit to it that she, they were with her and that she was back there investigating these crimes, these three crimes. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Well, at the same time she's doing that, Dad is temporarily away in China. He's, he's over there for supposedly a year. And... Um, while she's investigating these crimes. And uh, I think what happened was that she communicated, wrote a letter, or said something, or maybe he came back on leave, I'm not sure. Anyway, said something to Dad. Uh, you know, you didn't do the murders in Chicago, did you, jokingly or whatever. Anyway, the next thing we know is she starts running in fear of her life. And Dad unexpectedly comes back from China uh, quits his job over there with the United Nations, comes back, she starts fleeing, and within a month she's dead. Now, I believe that, that uh, she found out or discovered something in regards that connected him. But here's the kicker. The, um, her body, so she's tortured, she's um, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, bisected and, and taken and posed on this lot. And the street that she's posed off of, the killer, uh, I believe, Dad, uh, posed it, and the name of the street that he thought he was on was Degnan, D-E-G-N-A-N, because you come up Degnan and it forks off, and if you go to the right, you're still on Degnan, if you go to the left, you're on, the spot, you're, you're on a, a, another street that uh, with a vacant lot, so I'm blanking on the name right now, I can't believe I don't, anyway, um, he thought he was on Degnan, he poses the body. There. Well, what's the name of the little girl in Chicago that was murdered? Degnan. Well, I've never even heard of that name. Anyway, so that's another one of his taunting clues. He poses. So you're going to investigate me on Degnan? Okay. So he poses the body off the street, which he thinks is Degnan. Okay, fast forward. The next crime we've got is, has, to answer your question now, is in Manila. Young woman. Her body's nude, bisected surgically bisected by a skilled surgeon, posed on a vacant lot eight blocks from my father's house uh, uh, on a street. It's called, because the, the, their most, one of their most famous unsolved is called the Jigsaw Murder. What's the name of the street that that body's posed on? Zodiac. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, no way. You know, there's, there's no way that this can be. So that's what pointed me. And the Manila killing is, is, you know, it was a surgeon. It was a, um, there's no question about it. And, and uh, it's a copycat Dahlia murder that occurred in 67. Okay. So you're right. I mean, he did keep on killing. Uh, uh, we have the Riverside murder in 66 of Sherry Joe Bates, which is, uh, which is uh, Zodiac connected uh, in 67. And then we come back in 68. We start the murders start in, in in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and um, again there's the the connections to the the the, the map and, and all of this. It all fits into this very twisted. Um, uh, this was part of his insanity, uh, and it gets it goes gets into surrealism. Uh, the surrealists believe that there was no difference between the dream and the waking state, and and. They played that intellectually. Dad really believed it. In other words, he believed that there was no difference between a dream and, a, and, and an action you do as, you know, uh, uh, with your own volition. 
Uh, so you can kill, you can do anything you want. There is no uh, God. There is no nothing to stop you from doing all of this. And that was his personal insanity. And uh, where the others intellectualized it and played with it, he actually walked the walk and did it. I mean, yeah. He actually went out there and did it. And that's what, what makes him one of the most, I mean, uh, I have by the end of um, this book, I've presented 25 different murders that I believe are, that he was responsible from 19, basically 1940 to 1970. So almost one, one a year, averaging <laughs> one a year. How did that change your relationship with him now? As in, um, so you've you've lived and he's passed on, but now that you've done this research and are pretty confirmed about his murder past, has it changed the way you felt about him now? <laughs> well, I've, I've been through every possible emotion in the last 14 years. I've been through every possible emotion you, you, you can imagine, and... You know, I loved my father. I, I loved him and I respected him. And you know, I, I went through various emotions when I when I looked at all of the absolute horror and how it's affected so many lives. You know, it's not just the victims, but it's their family members and the not knowing and the you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, people have been affected by this car his carnage. You know. Uh, I've come to the. I think I've come to the position where it's, I see him as a Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's an easy thing to say, but I, I think he actually really was, um, because in many of the notes, and it, this is interesting because it links him to all of the different crimes. In Los Angeles, he promises. He writes a note promising there will be more. Chicago, he writes a note there will be more. In Riverside, he writes a note, there will be more. And in San Francisco, in Zodiac, he says there will be more killings. So that's a huge connection there, just in in his his voice. And I see that's the Mr. Hyde inside of him, uh, the monster that's the stronger. And I think the Dr. Jekyll, the good part, who could have you know done so much with his talents, uh, was the weaker and, and was controlled. And, and, and we see this in many of his writings especially as Zodiac. So, you know, I love my father. I love him to this day. I mean, he created me. His blood is flowing through me. Right. My gene pool is, is him. So there's a part of me that is never going to stop being able to love my father, even though he was probably one of the world's most horrific misogynists and misanthropes that's ever walked the planet. Um, so, and I hate the monster inside of him, the, the Mr. Hyde. But so I'll, you know, I, I guess you could say I'm kind of emotionally bisected, just as Elizabeth was physically bisected, you know, and I, there's nothing I'll ever be able to do to, to mend that or do anything about it. Yeah, I was just thinking that it must have been kind of um, weird to look back at times when you were hanging out and, and being with him, like in the times of San Francisco in the last 10 years, do you think he continued murdering then? No. I, I suspect, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that probably the 1970 murder was probably his last. Uh, the, the Paul Stein murder in 69, the cab driver. I mean, I don't know for sure, but he was, you know, I mean, you get, you get to a point where you just you're too old. I mean, he was 91 when he died. Yeah, he was. Uh, you know, at, at some point you just and he he had a lot of problems in the last few years of his life. Uh, he he was in a lot of pain. He was having a lot of problems with osteoporosis. He could hardly walk. He needed assistance. So, but he was white hot up until through his 70s, uh, and um, uh, so actually even further because. He was fine, you know, until the last five years before his death. So, uh, um, but you know, he, I I could be wrong, but I don't think he killed after 1969 or 70. He had June with him uh, at that point, and she was a she. You know, they were married 30 years, and she was a tremendous po positive influence on his life. She loved him very much, and uh, uh, I think she probably, could, you know, helped him control the beast inside, so to speak. And I think it just, 
I think we just burned up. That part just burned out eventually, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, wow. So that's um, quite a story and um, <laughs> quite a life. Um, <laughs> so uh, now, uh, now your new book has just come out, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, it just it was embargoed, and it's and it's it, and as I say, it's uh, it's a quick read. It's it's uh, what I do is I include a lot of uh, addendum in there, also in addition to the ten chapters. But the the key chapter, of course, is the is chapter ten, which is the decryption of the of Zodiac's uh, cipher, and uh, it, it's not one of the no. You know, you're probably familiar with the the uh, cryptograms. Yeah. You know, with the wording and stuff. It's not that. That's uh, you know, you can you can play with that and come up with just about any name you want. A uh, number of authors have you know said, hey, "There's the name," and you know, they're so it's, it's not that at all. It, it, it it's something else that Zodiac wrote that was much more subtle and much more disguised. And uh, uh, so, but it leaves no doubt. I mean, it's, believe me, I, I have a reputation at stake, and I wouldn't put it on live unless it was there. So, well, well, you're, there. But you're, you're expecting some backlash here because the Zodiac people are very, uh, very, oh, yeah. very, no, no, very no, no, aggressive. You're... And I know that, like, Grace Smith had, you know, was behind the movie and the books. Um, Thomas Horan, but... there's all those people. So, what, what, <laughs> are you ready for it? <laughs> Well, that, I don't get in a pissing contest with other theorists and stuff. You know, they, they can present theirs. I present mine. Uh, basically, my judge and jury are my readers. A and uh, you're not going to convince. They've already got their minds made up on it, either a certain suspect or whatever. So you're not going to change minds like that. You know, you just, they're going to they're gonna have a hard time coming up with I mean, I'm, I tried to come up with an alternate explanation for this. I'm pretty good at it, but I haven't been able to yet. But I'm, I'm sure that you're right. That the, some naysayer will say, "Well, here's another explanation." Oh yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. and you can't take it. I mean, again, you can't just take it on that one. You have to take the whole picture. You know, the 31 signatures alone is is you know very damning. I mean, we're we're talking about uh, things as as unique and special as um, you know. Avenger draws a crude drawing. The Black Eye Avenger in the 40s draws a crude drawing of a knife dripping blood and mails it to the press. Zodiac draws a crude drawing of a knife dripping blood and mails it to the press. And, um, you know, things like that that are like, wait a minute, you know, uh, Avenger takes pre cut clothesline lengths with him on his crimes to use. Zodiac takes pre cut clothesline with him on his crimes to use, you know, uh, cut and pasted mailings, the voice, the, the voice, the taunting voice is the same. Um, I mean, it just goes on and on. So I'm not just using general, yeah. you know, uh, general uh, MO, I'm using very specifics. How do, you, how do you find people, like when you go out and you're putting these uh, together, like when you're, you're, you know, your update and even the original books, how do you find people um, when you're going out trying to get evidence and 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 talk to people that were around in the situations and the events, uh, are most of them are pretty good or forthcoming, or are they kind of don't want to talk or? Well, it depends. Um, I, you know, it just depends on where they're coming from. For example, one of my uh, important witnesses in the in the Dahlia investigation was a retired police officer by the name of Merle McBride. She was actually the last one to see Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, uh, just hours before she was murdered on the 14th of, uh, on the evening of, afternoon of the 14th of January of 47. And uh, she, Elizabeth came running up to her in uh, the Grace, uh, at the uh, uh, bus station, uh, Greyhound bus station downtown LA, and said, there's a man in there, he's threatened to kill me, you know, uh, and they talked, and they went back. Well, the man was gone, but the, she got her purse. And uh, she was long retired, obviously. And I, I finally located her in San Diego, and uh, met. And she, she was absolutely delightful. I mean, she was—I forget what she was—late 80s, sharp as a whip, you know, and very cooperative. And, and um, 
and made it very clear that there was no doubt that, that the woman that ran up to her was Elizabeth Short, that, that LAPD, you know, kind of fogged it over because they felt that, well, that puts, you know, if you talk to her and she's afraid of her life and the next thing you know she becomes the LA's most famous crime, maybe it's better we just say you, you weren't so sure. But she says, that's not the truth of it. She says, I was absolutely sure. So, you know, you get fascinating things like that. And I talked to the original witness who found the body, um, Betty Bersinger, who was walking with a stroller, uh, on a stroller taking her young daughter to market and actually came across the body. Uh, so it's just amazing. And, they're, and generally, they're very open, and, and, you know, it's how you approach it. And that's what I was talking about a little bit uh, earlier in regards to you, you have to have the people skills. You have to have that human approach. In, in to talking to witnesses, because otherwise they won't even open the door to you. You know, it's like I don't need I don't need a subscription to your magazine. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. You know. And, and so again, and th that's what I worry about. Those some of those skills are being lost from f from us old school detectives who realized how important. I guess I'm not old school. I guess I'm old old school now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> who, who real who realized how important that you know to develop those skills are, and I I just worry that they're they're being lost. I could be wrong. I'm sure there's some very well. Very I, I I I certainly agree with you, but I think it's I, I and I have the same opinion. But maybe it's just an evolution. Maybe the new world will um, deal with each other in this mechanical way, and it'll be okay. I don't know. Uh, for us, yeah. it's, it's it's harder the older we are because, you know, it's not yeah. it's not how we do it's things. Different. Yeah, it's different. You yeah, know, I'm just it's hoping. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but, but, but there are bright signs too. They're they're much more. You know, you look at today's youth and they're they're so open to. I mean, you you rarely see the kind of prejudice and bigotry that you see in in you know white haired people and. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. So th there are a lot of positive, uh, positives about uh, the youth of today, and there. Yeah. And, yeah. And I just, yeah. I just think we're turning into our parents, not yours, as in <laughs> killing, but I as hope in, not. As in, I, I more, I was thinking more like uh, the rest of us parents, as in we're, uh, <laughs> no, just the idea of when we start looking at, you know, you're getting older when you look at the generation, kind of going, I don't get it, or. They're not doing yeah, this no, right know. because I'm sure our parents would say that about us. Exactly. You know, I mean, you know. Well, there's a. I wrote an open letter to to my readers, and it's on my website, stevehodell.com. And uh, there's a blog site. There's a. You go to the website, and you click on uh, Squad Room Blog, and, and that'll take you to my blogs. And the most recent one is I, I've written. I've also posted the introduction to the new book and my letter kind of explaining uh, 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 where, where I'm coming from on it. So, you know, your readers might want to just check that out to get a better feel of of, of uh, what the new book is offering. Oh, for offering. sure. For sure. And actually, and if someone wanted to contact you that listens to this, um, how would you like to get contact? Is if they had information uh, or something they want to pass on? Yeah. Yeah. The best, probably the best way is through my email, which is steve at stevehotel.com. Well, that's easy, and yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, that's great. And uh, I recommend the books. Um, any last words? No. Well, thanks for the opportunity. There's, there's just so much. I mean, it's oh yeah. Like yeah. I said, you've got four books, two thousand pages, seven hundred and fifty photo exhibits. So uh, it all ties together. And there's a you know, it, it's amazing how to me. It's amazing how the doors just kept opening. Yeah. And I never expected this last one. I really, you know, I, I'm still hoping for DNA. You know, there's a whole subject, there's a whole chapter on DNA. But and there's so much DNA that uh, should be available and they haven't developed it. They right. don't have a valid, uh, there's a whole story on that. A lot of people are on the impression they have Zodiac DNA. They don't. They have three markers of DNA that... Could be from anybody. Could be from one of the detectives that handled the outside of the envelope. Could be a reporter that got it originally. Could be the mailman. You know, so yeah. they ha don't have confirmed DNA, and that's frustrating because I thought it would be pretty easy once. You know, we'll just I have my dad's full DNA. Yeah. I got it a few years ago, so 
It's yeah. a simple matter of comparing. So maybe they will. Right. But with, even without it, I think this new evidence is as good as DNA. Wow. Well, we thank you for doing all the work, the research, and, and really putting yourself out there. It's not easy um, putting your name and and things behind because there will be a lot of negative as well as positive. Oh, yeah. But you know what? Oh, yes. But um, yeah. some of us appreciate yeah. it. We appreciate the work you're doing, and we're glad and uh, and uh, wish you the best and uh, hope to have you again. Okay, Alan, thank you very much. Good to, it's been good talking with you and, and your listeners. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. This has been a production of the Z Talk Radio Network. Should I